nobody is perfect in reversal. If you were to speak to any competitor post-show and they say to you, I was perfect, I was on point with my macros, I didn't you know, go off plan with my meal plan, six to eight weeks, I was perfect, I didn't put a foot wrong. Even Seabum, you see him eating donuts and all sorts of things post-show at the moment. Hello and welcome to another vlog on YouTube and podcast on Spotify by the Fit Minds podcast. Coach Mariah Jean here. So I would have Chloe with me today, but I've got a teething baby and one of us has got to do the podcast. So decided to take this one on solo. It's probably incredibly crucial that I do this podcast, not just for my own competitors, but the purpose of providing support and information for other competitors, whether you are with another coach, whether you've finished up for the season, whether you are kind of in between as well, you don't really know what you're doing, um, or even so if you're looking at embarking on a comp prep journey in the future and you haven't really considered reversal, recovery, or what happens post-show. Um, there are quite a few podcasts out there on this topic and I wanted to put my own spin on it add in the notes and information that I would add for my competitors, um, things that I've spoken to my competitors about in the past, helped a lot of my athletes reverse out of their shows and also touch on the importance of our inability to control a lot of factors post-show. So this hopefully provides a little bit of reassurance, clarity and maybe can help some competitors who are not in the best headspace after a show. It really is a very vulnerable time for competitors. We're talking about comp prep reversal, recovery and post-show blues. So three crucial components of what happened you know, after a show to a competitor on both a physiological, so very physical um, level, and a psychological level. So the impacts it has on your body from a hormonal endocrine um, function perspective, but also on how you are feeling mentally, internally, and sometimes some of the, I would say, not so favorable thoughts that you might've had prior to prep will rear their ugly head. And even so, some people find themselves in a worse position post-show than they were before competing mentally. So I want to try and prevent this as much as possible. As coaches, it should be our highest priority after a show to help clients recover, reverse, increase calories slowly over time, to help them accept the changes occurring to their body, but also be able to battle some of those struggles post-show. And I've likened it to, if you've uh, prepped with me before, I've talked about being a a chicken, a free range chicken. And when you are in prep, despite having the flexibility of tracking your macros, if you are tracking and you're not on a meal plan, you've got that flexibility of food choices within macros, obviously that fit, but things that you can't track, such as foods that you eat out and you don't know what they've put in them, etc. cetera, um, you know, they can't be included. So you end up as a, a cage chicken. You're a chicken in a cage, you've got some freedom, but you're still in a cage. And unfortunately, that restrictive process then uh, means that when you are freed, if you're put out as a free range chicken, not only are you now a free range chicken, but there are just no fences entirely. So, you know, people do find that because they don't have that eminent goal of competing anytime soon, there's no comps ahead, there's no stability that they can visualize or mentally compartmentalize, um, that they all of a sudden think, well, what's the point? You know, there's these thoughts in your mind of what's the point eating on track? What's the point of following my macros? I just want to have some freedom. I want that flexibility. You hear a lot of these types of phrases and even in the caption on social media that we wrote, which is talking about, I want flexibility. I don't want to restrict, but I don't want to blow out, right? I don't want to gain body fat, but I don't want to keep tracking my macros. I want to keep tracking my calories. I want to have this freedom. And so um, partially the strong thoughts of wanting freedom comes from the fact that you have just spent 
20, 30, 40, maybe even longer weeks tracking your food. For some people, it's it's quite a long period of time, right? And you are thinking, I, I don't think I can do another day of this. What's my purpose behind this? I don't need to lose body fat. I don't need to stay lean. So there's this almost lack of justification for staying on track or at least treating your body with a bit more respect, right? And so that's probably the way that we need to view it is that uh, tracking macros is not and calories or even following a meal plan is not just, it doesn't just serve a purpose in the way of fat loss. It serves a purpose in the way of nourishing your body as well and giving you structure and routine to go by that doesn't necessarily have to be a constant string of restriction back and forth, chopping and changing. The other reason why post-show is just so difficult for competitors is because there are a string of um, issues that arise with hormones, hormone function. And so we see from a prolonged period of time of dieting, so lower calorie restriction, unfortunately there is a suppression of appetite across that time. It's just what your body does to be able to cope with the stress of dieting. And then what happens after a show when you start to increase calories and you've had them increased for a few weeks, even one to two weeks, it depends on each person, we see this spike in what's called ghrelin, um, a hunger hormone, which um, can be incredibly difficult to resist. So you find yourself feeling uncontrollably hungry all the time. You wake up really hungry, you go to bed hungry, you eat a meal, it's a big meal, it should fill you up, you're still hungry, you feel like you're a bottomless pit, you want to snack all the time. There's this almost, yeah, as I said, uncontrollable urge. It's incredibly important to look at this for what it is um, it's not just you going through this to experience this hunger post-show, but every single competitor will go through this phase. And obviously there were phases in your comp prep where you were hungry and you resisted as well. And it is about that, almost the muscle that we've, we've built up in our minds of being able to resist. But when there's not a lot of, I would say, purpose behind resisting or restricting, you, you then obviously lose sight of that. So it's a recipe for disaster. The hunger hormones kick in, you're hungry, you think, oh, well... It doesn't matter because I'm not going to compete anytime soon, so I don't need to maintain this physique, um, I don't need to stay on track. And then I see a lot with competitors after these instances or bouts of whether it's snacking or binge eating or massive binge eating episodes, which is a huge red flag, is that then there's a lot of shame and a lot of guilt. It's incredibly crucial that we understand that that shame and guilt is not only not necessary, despite obviously very difficult, it's very difficult to control that feeling, but it's incredibly um, detrimental and damaging to a competitor's psyche. Um, you end up in this perpetual state, the cycle of restrict binge, restrict binge, and then some competitors will even not follow their own macros that they've got to track. Their reversal macros, they might binge and then try and restrict their calories back to what they were in prep. And so you end up almost creating disordered eating patterns and behaviors post-show. And this is, it's so important to understand, this is not your coach's fault. This is not your fault. This is not anybody's fault. It's not pointing fingers of, I have seen sometimes in the past, people have said I didn't have enough support post-show and it's like they're trying to put the blame on someone. Someone's got to be responsible for this. Um, the highest responsibility, it actually falls upon the process itself. And the fact that comp prep is very extreme, it does do this. We need to be prepared for this. I would liken it to the similar aspects of not being prepared for having a child. When you're pregnant, you, you're going through these different changes in your body and you're experiencing all of these symptoms and it's really exciting, but no one really prepares you for what happens when you actually have the baby. <laughs> And so there's no, you know, real textbook or rule book for that. It's so similar with comp prep in a sense that you push hard, you, you've got the set amount of time you know that you've got to um, endure something and commit to it. And then afterwards, sometimes it can feel like a big emotional drop off a cliff. There is this huge high, and this is another aspect of comp prep where we see this almost like a perfect storm. You have this huge high, you've just competed, you look incredible, you know, you're shredded, everyone's complimenting you, saying you look amazing. People who haven't competed before or even 
understand bodybuilding, who are so external to it, they are just so far removed from it, they look upon your reversal and start to almost judge you or you think they might be judging you. You worry about whether or not people are looking at you differently because you've gained body fat. You have to explain to people why you can't maintain your physique. And so it becomes something that almost feels like you're crashing down from, I don't know, like a tall building or you've been on a podium and now you feel like no one cares about you or anything like that. And so this is partially why going into a comp prep with the desire to gain external validation is incredibly dangerous because once your show has ended and they lose interest in things that aren't necessarily as entertaining and that's not got anything to do with you, you don't, can't control that. You're not a person who um, like should be chasing someone else's validation or acceptance because uh, it's more about what we think about ourselves at the end of the day. At the end of the day. But you've got to get used to it. You've got to get used to the fact that when you're in prep, there will be a lot of hype. People will congratulate you. People will talk you up and everything like that. They will, you know, um, get behind you. And then it feels like post-show that everything kind of just goes back to normality for everybody else. And you're kind of stuck in this position where you're still trying to find your normal. And it takes so long. Uh, you do, the good news is, you do get better and better at this each prep that you do. So... Your first prep, and I will say from my own experience, my first prep, um, I'd been bodybuilding for seven years before I did my first prep. I went straight into figure, won the overall win. We all all know that story with ICN and classic figure. Didn't expect it. Came out of it, and I had prior been incredibly good with my food. I was an ex-anorexic, so tracking food, being meticulous with calories, etc., was something I was very experienced with, and great with self-control right then obviously recovered from it but then went through prep came out the the other side and I'm not going to say I didn't have support I did have support Um, I had my coach there he was incredible Um, he didn't behave any differently we kept doing check-ins and that's why I continue to do check-ins with my clients post-show for the exact reason and then I remember thinking to myself I didn't want to do another show and they did one and I think I gained From a stats perspective, like 10 kilos in 10 weeks, I'm pretty sure. Now, I was quite lean. I think I scanned in at 7% or something like that um, for my show. 7, 8, maybe it's 8. And since got leaner for the next season. But I almost didn't recognize myself when I'd gained the 10 kilos. And I was, I think I was at like a fitness expo or something doing an event for ICN. And I'd, I jumped on stage just for fun because we were doing you know, like a little bit of a, uh, I think it was just a promotional event. So the off season girls who jumped on stage and I looked at photos of myself and I was like, oh my God, like that's not stage lean. <laughs> not that it was a competition, but these are the types of, um, the motions that you will go through post show where you find it very difficult to accept the changes in your composition, the increases in body fat, the, your clothes fitting differently, um, comments from random people, uh, not feeling as though it's almost like you feel as though you're not progressing, you're going backwards because you think that increases in body fat is a bad thing and that, you know, somehow we need to hold on to dear life, to the conditioning that we had for our show. It is important for you to remember your show is over. It's done. Your season is finished. And if you can't become to terms with that, that it is finished, eventually you will um that it doesn't necessarily mean it's the end of your journey entirely it doesn't mean that you know bodybuilding you have to hang up your heels or anything like that it's not drastic it doesn't mean that you won't come back to stage it doesn't mean that the stage will disappear anytime soon and I've said this and I've used this analogy with many clients before is that it doesn't mean that the goalposts have been removed altogether right the goalposts have just been moved they've just been moved further forward in the future right or sorry further back so they're further away from you and when you conceptualize it that way the goalposts still exist right you still have goals right post show the initial goal right is to recover is to rest and is to look after yourself right it's not necessarily to go crazy with your strength goals it's not to try and you know I absolutely have seen 
competitors come out of shows and want to grow and I think that's incredibly important to have those goals but the primary goal is to restore your health is to get your body back to homeostasis and homeostasis looks incredibly different for each person you know for some women homeostasis from a a body fat percentage or even a caloric intake perspective because it's more about the calories we consume rather than the body fat percentage some women might maintain around 18 16 percent and their hunger hormones settle down um, you know others they may maintain between 20 and 25 they may look completely different to the next person at that body fat percentage as well and so this is why when we talk about what's an ideal body fat percentage to get to in your off season or to even limit yourself to it depends it's so different from person to person from athlete what i would say is more important is where are you at a stage in your reversal where you can say I've got balance in my life with food. I don't feel triggered by things. I don't feel like I have to go crazy with my food and eat all different types of food under the sun or food fixation is, is somewhat um, gone. I'm not body checking all the time. I feel comfortable in my clothing. I feel like my strength is increasing. My menstrual cycle has returned. I've had maybe one to three um, menstrual cycles continuously in a row. Fun fact, after I prepped myself into my last season, I lost my menstrual cycle 12 weeks before I competed and I actually got maybe signs of it in peak week probably because of the increase in calories and that's just impossible to prevent and then post-show I think it took three months something like that for it to return and then at that point it was kind of all over the place for six months and then um, after that point I then had it continuously for six months so reversal is technically we would consider it to be crucially recovery phase the six to eight weeks post-show this is where competitors are most vulnerable, where they can feel lost, isolated, alone, ashamed, all of these incredibly negative emotions associated with their reversal and can often hide things or want to hide them from their coach, almost isolate themselves as well. And it can be a very confusing time. I know I've been there three times myself. I've done three seasons. And each time I learned a little bit more about myself and about the reversal process. Nobody is perfect in reversal. If you were to speak to any competitor post show and they say to you, I was perfect, I was on point with my macros, I didn't you know, go off plan with my meal plan, six to eight weeks, I was perfect. I didn't put a foot wrong. Even Seabum, you see him eating donuts and all sorts of things post show at the moment and cookies and stuff and snacking. Just because you're going through those motions of not eating on plan or not eating on point with your macros doesn't mean you're failing. It doesn't mean that you're not reversing properly. It doesn't mean that you, you know, suck or you've got no self-control or that you are a, a failure. I hear this a lot. Like, I feel like a failure. I feel, don't feel like myself, all that type of stuff. What is incredibly important? I say important and crucial a lot in, in this podcast because it really is is that you forgive yourself as quickly as possible for anything. Whether you have had an episode of uncontrolled eating, whether you have snacked a couple of extra times here and there, whether you've had a donut untracked or whatever, um, not in your macros, and you thought to yourself, I shouldn't have done that, or you had immediate regrets or whatever it was, forgive yourself. At the end of the day, once you've eaten it, there's not much you can do about it. And if you enjoyed the food at the time, you know, that you shouldn't really have shame associated with it either. But it's all a learning curve. It's all learning about, I wouldn't say having any flexibility, but having an idea of how much flexibility you can incorporate without impacting your mental health mostly. Because increases in body fat post show, I must stress that body fat is not permanent. Whether you gain 10, 20 kilos post-show, not that I would recommend gaining 20 kilos in a short space of time, but certainly if it happens, if you gain, like I did, 10 kilos in 10 weeks, that's actually not terrible, but it's also maybe not ideal either. And we really can't say what is an ideal reversal or what that looks like. But ballpark, first couple of weeks, if you are looking at you know the first one to four weeks in that very crucial time post-show, if you think that, if your peak week was a, a increase in calories, technically you're somewhat reversing then already. You're going to see a gain of a couple of kilos. For men, maybe three to five kilos. For women, two to three, four kilos. And that's where we see, if you were to graph this out, I've seen a few really good graphs done on this. There's an initial spike 
in body weight, which we see will constitute an increase in glycogen, which is additional carbohydrates and water stored in the muscle tissue. So that's not all body fat, all right? You do get those increases in the beginning where your muscles are very full of carbs, basically. And then the remainder will be body fat, yes. And that's okay. That's not a negative thing. Because you've been so conditioned your entire prep to thinking that fat loss is the major goal, of course, it's incredibly difficult to pivot and to normalize body fat gain. If you do not gain body fat post-show and you try to maintain a conditioned physique, there are some pretty negative impacts of that. Things like um, you can obviously then have an irregular menstrual cycle, which points towards your hormones uh, not being where they need to be. And it's not just the side effect of not having a menstrual cycle, but everything, low libido, um, impacts on vitamin absorption, impacts on your mood and mental health. You can end up with depression, um, increased bouts of anxiety, obsession with food, etc. Perhaps even the early stages of disordered eating, not necessarily, and I wouldn't say in most cases, eating disorders don't necessarily always arise from a post-show. Disordered eating behaviors, yes, if it goes on for a few months, but if then it kind of flattens out and normalizes after a time a period of time, then it's not an eating disorder itself. But you can see some people come out of comp preps developing eating disorders, which is incredibly frightening and nothing that I would want for any of my competitors. And this is where a coach's role comes in. We can do as much as we can do. We can do check-ins like we usually do. We can do little interim check-ins where we check in and ask how our competitors are going uh, in between official check-ins. It is, however, your responsibility and something I would strongly encourage and recommend you to do is to speak to your coach. Bring it up with your coach. Talk to them. Be transparent with them. They're humans. Most coaches have been through a comp prep and a reversal themselves. And if they sit on their high horse and say they were perfect and that you be better or whatever or or they start to shame you for things, get a new coach. It's impossible to do a reversal perfectly. And... There, as I said, there is no right or wrong way, but there are certainly ways that are less than ideal for your, mostly your mental health, because I don't necessarily think that body fat gain, despite it being very uncomfortable for a lot of people, it's, as I said, not permanent. So um, when you come out of that phase, let's say you have one of the most difficult reversals you gain. I've seen some people gain 20, 30 kilos, um, not my own clients necessarily, but Um, certainly in a very short space of time and ended up in a position where they've even mentioned, oh my gosh, my composition is not as favorable as it was before I started prep. So yes, people can can really go south. Um, And it's to me, because I've been in a position where I've competed reversed a couple times and your first one was definitely less than ideal um, and even been anorexic as well and, and gained body fat on purpose. So I've been in a position where I've had to normalize it Um, outside of a comp prep phase I don't think it's a negative thing about body composition I don't view it as that I don't think oh this person's let themselves go or they've gained body fat and they look terrible nothing like that you know I think that I remember mentally how difficult it was for me to look at myself and not recognize myself and feel uncomfortable so I get a little bit more concerned less than about the body fat because I know that don't worry about it you know like further down the track we could probably do a mini cut to tidy up a little bit but there should be no discussion of that in the beginning of a reversal I worry so much about my competitors mental health um, and the way that it impacts them mentally given that as I said I've experienced it myself but I see it a lot is that the impacts on psychological on the psychological side of things are, are tenfold huge uh, and people will say it all the time and I, I vouch for it reversal I wouldn't say from a perspective of effort, it's harder than prep. Prep is obviously incredibly difficult because day in, day out, you are depleted, tired, hungry, all that type of stuff, and you keep pushing yourself to the brink. So I would say comp prep is more difficult from an effort perspective, but reversal is more difficult from a self-control perspective. And certainly uh, mentally, your self-esteem as well takes a huge hit. It doesn't have to be that way, though. I have seen competitors now Um, even more recently that I've had in their second or third seasons who reverse out of prep um, like a champ. Now, I'm not saying they're perfect with their calories or macros or they don't have flexibility, but they've actually learned how to find their balance to be able to incorporate flexibility without blowing out. 
and to normalize fat gain, to normalize the fact that they will increase in body fat, that they will slowly reverse out and eventually go into a growth phase where they're in maybe a surplus or maybe they'll maintain for a little bit. But a few things, a few notes I've made on this topic because I could go on forever about it. But when you do find yourself, a few tips and pointers, when you find yourself in a position where there's lots of different types of foods, you know, I could go to my cupboard right now and there's a hundred different types of foods in there, right? Look at it from a very far removed, less emotional perspective. Try as much as you can to remove yourself emotionally from it and think about it this way. I've said this before to competitors, but the food will always be there. You know, it's like I thought about post-show all the different types of foods that I could try. And the first reversal made a huge list of restaurants to go to and different foods I wanted to have and nada. The second one, less so. And the third one, I didn't make a list at all. And it's because I know that those thoughts going on inside my mind, the food fixation, saving pictures of food on Instagram, everything like that, don't be ashamed for it, but see it for what it is. It is literally just your mind saying, I want calories. I want tons of calories because I'm, I'm depleted. I need more energy. Um, you know, give it to me. It's a survival mechanism. It's got nothing to do with the fact that you actually need to eat seven donuts in a row. It's got nothing to do with the fact that you need to try 10 different types of desserts. You don't need that at all. And the food will always be there. So instead of making lists of foods that you want to try, maybe just allow life to come at you naturally. And in social environments as well, something that was super helpful post-show, my last reversal was to look at things if there was food on offer and think to myself, outside of a reversal, would I usually eat this food? Do I like this food? Do you know what I mean? These are the discussions I would have my, with myself. A great example is like, I don't like tiramisu as a dessert. There are lots of different desserts I don't like. There are some things, just the textures, I can't stand them. Even savory foods, some savory foods, I'm just not a big fan of. Um, I don't, like, I'm not a big fan of popcorn. It's just, you know what I mean? A bit of an unpopular opinion or sushi. I don't really like sushi. I'm so sorry for those who love sushi. So, and there are certain foods I do enjoy and I do like, and I'm pretty simple in, in that sense, but everybody has different food preferences, right? And so if post-show you're at a birthday, an event, Christmas, because obviously we're going into Christmas as well, you are... I don't know, even going out for dinner with family or friends or breakfast or something like that, you're having a celebration or just in general, just have, spending some time with family. Look at it for what it is. Would you, outside of comp prep, eat a stack of 10 pancakes in one sitting with ice cream and Maltesers and whatever added on top? Now, obviously thinking about that post-show, you're thinking to yourself, wow, oh, that sounds delicious. It makes me feel sick thinking about eating that at the moment because I'm obviously not post-show and I'm not craving all these things. But if you answer the question, would I usually do this? No, I wouldn't. Then just skip it. Just say to yourself, I know what this tastes like. I remember what this tastes like. I don't need it right now. This is just my brain playing tricks on me. And it's not because we're trying to prevent you from gaining body fat. We're trying to prevent you from treating your body like shit. Eating crap all the time is going to make you feel absolutely awful. And this is not a lecture. I did it and I remember feeling crap. So I often now go back the second, third time reversing. And, you know, I think we went for pancakes breakfast once for my last reversal. Burgers once was post-show. Um, and then there was a handful of places we went. And I can't even remember them, but it was like, I think we went out to eat three to four times or something like that. And that was in the space of maybe a couple of months. Now, the first reversal, I was out every day or every week and every weekend, multiple times, making lists of things, finding extravagant desserts, getting them ordered to my place, everything like that. And I just lost interest in it the third time round because I realized that it's just not novel anymore. And it wasn't, and it was funny because I didn't resist the foods because I didn't want to gain body fat. It, I resisted them because I just remember not feeling good when I ate them. I felt physically ill um, and stuff like that. So the food will always be there. Things like, I don't know, what's some examples? Brownies, cookies, they will still exist in six to eight weeks' time. They will still exist in six months' time. And I always used to ask myself this. If I still feel like this food in a couple of months, I will allow myself the treat to have it. If I don't feel like it in a couple of months and give yourself a few months, then 
it was obviously just a spur of the moment thing. And it was because I had deprived myself for so long that I now wanted it, right? Once you get back to life normality and your hunger hormones settle down, you actually feel like you can slowly bring these foods back in. Um, you know, you can have ice cream in the house again and you don't feel like eating it. I've had a tub of ice cream in my freezer for weeks and I might have a couple of spoonfuls. I had a bowl last night and I probably won't eat it again for two weeks because I just don't feel like it. But often the reason why competitors are driven is because number one, they're hungry. Number two, they've got all these cravings. But number three, they have this insane panic that they have to eat it because they haven't had it for so long. And it's this thing for them to look forward to. Um, but not they're not thinking about any of the other parts of it. They're not thinking about how it makes them feel afterwards. The fact that it stuffs with their digestion, the fact that... Um, they may not have even felt like eating it. They've just eaten it because it's because they're there or because it's bored, you know, because they're bored, sorry. So um, these are all the things. It's about having an internal dialogue that is stronger than the hunger hormones. I'm hungry at the moment while doing this podcast and I know that I'll have lunch a little bit and that's okay. I just don't think about it. I'm trying not to think about it. Very difficult to do post-show when your hunger hormones are rife. You've also... Um, taken your attention away from something you were so invested in something and now you feel like you've got nothing to fill the gap so it's crucial that you get outside distract yourself emerge yourself in a new project or use your spare time to return to doing something that you enjoy doing like drawing for me it was skating I went back to skating post-show I like skating um, and it just feels like you know I'm taking myself away from something comp related it doesn't mean you have to stop bodybuilding altogether as well. It's important to know that um, things like your hobbies and passions like bodybuilding will come and go in the way of how passionate you feel about them, but it won't necessarily mean that you need to quit them. So post-show, a lot of people have these thoughts of, should I compete again? When will I compete again? Can I compete as soon as possible to try and keep themselves on track or to have something to focus on? And they're not thinking about the next phase of growth, of strength, of improvement, of investing energy into something like they did previously. This is a rinse and re repeat process, but it takes a long time. Um, and you may go through phases where you don't feel like training. You're not sure why you're following your macros anymore. Like you feel like you've lost your purpose. I cannot stress this enough to competitors who loved competing and loved being on stage. Do not throw your bodybuilding away and go and chase a shiny object for three to six months, only then to come back to bodybuilding realizing, fuck, I've just wasted six months. Don't get me wrong, it's probably not going to hurt you or whatever. You might be able to maintain your muscle, but ride it out. Ride that three to six month period out where it feels like, you know, I don't really want to be here for my sessions. I don't want to push. I don't know what my purpose is anymore. Because trust me when I say you will want to come back. You will want to do it again. It's just this phase that you go through. Important you talk to your coach about potentially taking a deload. So taking a full week off training. I always give my girls and guys a three-day training week post-show and then I give them the option we talk in check-ins about would you just like a full week off altogether this can be difficult from a self-control perspective as well because then you're not doing much at all with your time so if anything it's good to get to the gym to pass the time and to give yourself something to especially around the time where you feel like you're hungrier than usual fill that gap with training it's important to start to set new goals as well I wouldn't say straight away but to have goals somewhere in the future it's all right I might compete again in a couple of years I know I've got to grow a significant amount of muscle so I'm going to talk to my coach about how long I need to take to do that I need to accept the time that my coach has given me for some people it might only be six months because they've got a few things to tweak for others it might be one to two years and this is an acceptance that is not because your coach is trying to keep you on for coaching because they actually want to see you do well and do better and improve uh, commit yourself to that time not straight away but certainly after reversal is done then you can think about the growing phase Reversal is about uh, treating your body right, trying to find that balance, trying not to go crazy with food, but also understanding that you probably will a couple of times. That is okay. That is normal. Don't um, beat yourself up. Um, everybody does a similar thing. And as I said, it does get easier each prep. So the first prep, or if it's been a while since you've prepped years and years and years, it will be difficult because you won't remember what it was like. It's okay to slip up. You're human. We all slip up. It's so, so, so okay to slip up. Don't beat yourself up once it's done. Um, it's just so important to reflect, have conversations internally with yourself. Do not assume that you are not in control. You are in control of what you're doing. It's just hard. It's very difficult. It's very challenging. You just did a comp prep though. So you are incredibly capable of being able to hold back and you're incredibly capable of being able to say, I don't need this right now. Um, 
doesn't mean you're going to get it right every single time. But trust me when I say, if you set yourself up for success in reversal and you actually say to yourself, I can do this. And the reason why I want to do this is I may not be competing anytime soon, but I also don't want to see myself not necessarily gain body fat. I don't want to see myself go south with my mental health. I don't want to see myself crash and burn. I don't want to be in that position. I want to be able to say, look, I, I did my best. Um, meal prep is incredibly important in reversal. Keep your habits that you kept up in comp prep. It doesn't mean you have to do a crazy amount of steps, but keep eating fruits and vegetables. I see so many competitors not eating enough fruits and vegetables post-show because they're so fixated on eating processed foods. You, you will get sick, you'll get injured. Um, so many competitors get colds, they get sick post-show and it's because they neglect their micronutrient uptake. At the end of the day, the competitor mindset that you had in prep is the same mindset you need to adopt in reversal, less strict, but certainly don't go from this black and white you know, zero to 100 and back to zero again, assuming that post-show because there are no immediate goals that you can just do whatever you want and you can't be bothered. Look at it in a sense of, I didn't want to have this attitude prior to this. This isn't who I am and it's not what I'm about. So I'm going to get myself in order. You don't have to be perfect. It's just getting as close as possible, as consistent as possible. So meal prep is a great way of doing that. Start incorporating some of the foods that you enjoy. So if you've got my recipe eBooks, if you're my competitors, you actually have an incredible tool at your fingertips. There's amazing recipes for healthy brownies. And I mean healthy as in they've got beetroot in them. No, they don't taste terrible. They actually taste great. Um, there's some fantastic uh, main meals you can play around with that are like burgers that are macro friendly. So things that you can incorporate back into your foods that maybe you might have removed before. And you can start to play with your food a little bit more now and have that creativity. Something that helped me in prep and certainly my last reversal was having a limitation, not restriction, but just a limitation on how much I ate out. And generally, I will watch competitors in the six to eight weeks. If they're doing pretty well, we'll go, okay, cool. Let's incorporate a flexible day where you can eat out and stuff like that. And, you know, um, understand portions and all that, that type of jazz. If they're not, and they're all over the shop, we've got, we really need to pull it back in again and just get them to a point where they've got enough structure so that they're not going crazy all the time with food. Because structure is the key to, even though despite you viewing it as restriction, just structure, not restriction, is what actually allows you to get back on track in reversal and prevents a lot of these episodes because you've got a selection of foods that you like eating. You don't hate them, right? You try not to eat the things that repeatedly that you ate in prep if you're off them completely. But if you don't mind eating the same meals you ate in prep, then continue doing that. Um, I've seen some competitors that, you know, even at other coaches I've seen reversing at the moment, eating their same prep meals, just more of them, and they're happy doing it. Um, Myself, I like to have a bit of freedom. My last reversal, I didn't track, and this is, I would not recommend this for most competitors, but this was my third season. I prepped myself. I've been prepping competitors for, you know, uh, five years now and been in this industry for eight to nine years. So um, I didn't track a single day. The day after my show, I stopped tracking entirely. I would only recommend this to somebody who is incredibly good with macros and calories, knows absolutely what they're doing. Um, I didn't have any immediate goal to have been gone pro so I you know was like I'm probably not going to compete for a couple of years now um yeah I didn't track for I would say I think it was yeah maybe like a year and a half or something like that and I managed to maintain this is again a point you will probably eventually get to so maybe a second third fourth season you may get to a point where you don't need to track or you just like to track for the comfort of doing so but that was just my own approach and it was a much better reversal I think in 12 weeks it was six kilos or seven kilos or something like that that I gained and then I kind of maintained there so um, for a while. So that was definitely a more reasonable reversal um, in my opinion and my approach that I'd taken. This doesn't mean I'm saying I'm better than everybody. My first reversal was absolutely shit. It was terrible in my opinion for me. And um, going back, I don't have any regrets though because obviously going through it, it taught me a lesson um, but this, this podcast didn't exist back then when I reversed. There was no information. There was no, certainly not as many podcasts as there is now about it. Um, there just wasn't really a lot of talk about reversal back then. We've come a really long way in the way of comp prep since then. So removing food fixation and food lists is, is as I said, really important. So just try and you know, unsave all of the photos you've saved in Instagram. You know, delete all your food pictures. 
Um, go back to the, the macro friendly recipe ebooks, try and, you know, find some things you can track that, you know, you can make, if you want to play with your food, go ahead, just do it within reason. And similar to prep, try to plan less social events around food. You're probably going to want to plan more of them around food because you haven't before. But if someone says, Hey, let's, let's go for a walk. You don't have to have lunch as well. You can obviously, but, um, just look at the frequency of that. It's the most important thing. So I was going to touch on it before, but something I will do now, um, like even when I'm tracking now, I'm not at the moment postpartum, but um, when I am tracking to try and lose body fat or even when I'm kind of trying to maintain or in a build. So when I am tracking and have a specific goal, um, I tend to add in a day there, which is flexible or not even a full day, but just like one meal a week, whether it's like a Saturday night or a breakfast, or if we've got an event on, we're going out to dinner with friends or I've got a dinner this, this weekend, which is a going away party. Um, for a friend of mine and so that I'm um, sorry if you hear my dog snoring <laughs> she's just joined us that type of flexibility at a certain point is perfectly fine if you find that you can show some self-control and you just have a normal meal and you're not eating a million different types of things at dinner and you don't need to order all these different things and have a dessert as well and you, you find you've got that control self-control by all means having that that one meal a week isn't going to hurt but something I did a lot of was uh, having a full day worth of flexible eating, but spread across the weekend. So I would, you know, maybe go for breakfast out or have my normal breakfast or have something that I didn't track that I made at home. Um, and then let's say lunch, I had my meal prep. And then the next day I might either go out for lunch or again, just make something at home that wasn't tracked, that was still wholesome and balanced, plenty of it, veg, veggies and fruit and stuff. Um, and then dinner, if I had plans to go for dinner, it could be the Saturday or the Sunday, but overall across the weekend, you know, and it was a maximum of a flexible breakfast, a flexible lunch, a flexible dinner, a flexible snack or two. Right. And so that was an equivalent of one flexible day. And I would allow myself that across the weekend, if not across the entire week. So I kind of check them off and be like, okay, well, I've had my flexible breakfast. I've had my flexible lunch. I've had my flexible snack. And then I would eat my usual meals outside of that. That was actually um, my second reversal, how I did things. And it worked even better than my first reversal. So my second reversal was much more um, manageable and actually maintained pretty well there, but I was tracking. So the third reversal didn't track at all. Second reversal did track, but just gave myself um, a full flexible day, but spread across the week. I don't think having a full flexible day is necessarily that beneficial as in eating flexible breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks all on one day. Cause then you're kind of just overloaded and you get to dinner and you're just like, I'm just eating this because it's here, or I'm just going to eat street because I've got a flexible day. Right. So I wouldn't recommend doing eat street at all, whether obviously post show you do it once maybe, but then not again, um, because it's just a free for all. And it's just not somewhere where you want to put a competitor that has just finished a show. So the time reversing, as I said, takes around a six to eight weeks. Please do not try and negotiate or bargain with your coach as to how long you need to be reversing for. If they can clearly see you're not doing as well or you're struggling, it's not you failing. They're actually trying to look after you. And I have in the past been very lenient with clients and said, I know for financial reasons, you might want to step away for a bit and like, that's totally fine. But then they get in themselves into the position where they then say they didn't have enough support or you know, but I didn't um, get the help I needed, or, you know, and it's kind of they start blaming the coach. So it, this is the position I put my competitors in where it's like you are locked in for six weeks at least to do your reversal. If before that point, I think, yep, you're good to go. Don't stress about it. You're, you know, everything looks really good, even from a stats perspective, because stats don't lie. It's not about the fact that you're gaining too much. But if we can see there's big spikes, we'll obviously what you're saying and what's actually happening are two different things. We are not worried about your body fat. We are worried about how it's impacting you mentally and the fact that you're hiding it, right? Because this is the, where the disordered eating can come into play. So we're trying to prevent that from happening. This means that you might need an increase in calories, right? If you're, especially if you're really, really, really hungry and you're really lethargic, we might need another increase in calories. We do this gradually though, because even if we bumped your calories up to where we want them to be in your off season straight away, you're still going to have those hunger hormones. So it's like either way, you're going to be hungry. So what we want to do is slowly increase over time. Um, not super slow. I actually do probably bigger increases than what most coaches would. I don't drag reversal out any longer than it needs to go. I will do pretty big chunks. So, you know, two to 300 calories in one go increase. And then again, the next week and so on. 
Um, oftentimes though, if I see a competitor saying, look, I'm, I rarely get this, but I'm quite full, well then I won't necessarily increase their calories. And we know that we might've reached homeostasis a bit earlier. Discuss a weight, on that note, discuss a weight cap or body fat percentage cap with your coach. Something that I like to do pretty early on and not necessarily in a restrictive sense, but to give a client an idea of, okay, like this is the ceiling. Sometimes that can be a little bit negative in a sense that it can backfire because if I say, for example, a competitor is say 52 kilos and I say, look, the max we want to gain is 10 to 12 kilos post-show or 10 to 12% above current body weight or whatever it might look like. And I say, look, this is where we are at a reasonable composition. They can then almost see it as a race to get there. So they're like, oh, well, you know, I can gain, I can be 65 kilos now. So they just keep eating until they get there. It's important to know that it's not a race. We're trying to spread this out a little bit and it's both for physical and mental reasons. So when you do have that cap and that ceiling, it's like, all right, this is the end goal. Very similar to prep. This is what our stage weight goal would be. Well, by the end of reversal, this is what, you know, or even, for example, even longer than reversal, by the next 12 weeks or so, this is where the, the end goal should be, where we, where we want to end up. The good news is it does get easier. So the first few weeks of reversal are the hardest then it does get easier. Your hunger hormones start to settle as homeostasis. We you know, reach that point where we've got a higher level of energy availability. But the main reason if you are getting excess body fat, excessive, sorry, body fat gain, um, and you're thinking, what do I do? What am I doing wrong? It's probably because you're not following your macros or calories. Just get straight back on track with them. I hear this all the time from competitors. Should I go back into a deficit to fix it? No, don't do that. Just go back to your calories. If you get back on track for a few more days, you'll actually see that the water weight and extra carbs will subside and you're not in as bad of a situation as you thought you were. But it's very important you pick it up very quickly. Um, you don't let it become a landslide. Don't let it become something, well, now I've screwed it, so I may as well keep going. Self-sabotage is your biggest enemy in comp prep reversal and you are in full control of self-sabotage. Um, but it's most important that you try and shift out of that negative headspace of I'm not enough, I'm not, do not doing good enough, I'm failing, I'm shit, you know, all that type of stuff and move yourself more towards a mindset of I'm doing okay, I might make a few mistakes here and there, I might not have an ideal week, but I can pick it back up as quickly as I fell down. Do not try to maintain conditioning or glorify stage your stage physique as a permanent or sustainable position to be in. Very, very important, very crucial. We do not try to maintain conditioning. Do not ask your coach if you can maintain conditioning. Do not under consume your calories. Do not you know what I mean? Don't fall in love with the idea that you're going to have abs forever and that you're going to have lines all through your legs and everything like that. It is a temporary position for show only. This is not a lifestyle. You know, this is not, yes, bodybuilding is a lifestyle, but being lean is not a lifestyle. It's not lifestyle friendly. If you do have different size clothing in your closet, keep sizes for when you are in prep and keep sizes for when you are in a growth phase. And that way you don't fall in love with or at least start to compare yourself to when you were a size 6 versus a size 10 to 12, right? Bodybuilders must have a very diverse wardrobe and just accept the fact that some things are comp prep clothes and some things are not. Or put away, another competitor I was talking to the other day, put away your comp prep clothes, those sizes, store them away for later and then bring them back out again when you are in prep again. Buy bigger clothing sizes. If you threw out your bigger clothing sizes in prep, I'm sorry that you did that, but you will need bigger clothing sizes. And bigger is not worse. It's not bad. It's not negative. It's just a different phase of your life. Um, do not attempt to cut until you are at least five to six months post-show. This is very difficult to do to control yourself in this aspect, but trust me, it is worth it because the cut will actually be in a balanced and healthy way and you won't feel constantly hungry and your body will probably not like you doing that, right? So we have this problem with um, consistently low energy availability where we see competitors struggling with lots of different symptoms like disrupted sleep, fatigue, chronic fatigue, lib uh, drops in libido, everything, performance impact, uh, impacts, etc. So don't do a cut. Don't do it. Your coach won't let you do it. We are not here to tell you, oh yeah, let's do a cut to try and tidy things up again. Let's get you back to maintenance calories to, tie to tidy things back up again. So the hunger hormone, ghrelin, as I said, will be quite high. It does settle down. Leptin is a satiating hormone and you don't have a lot of this at the moment. And the main reason why is because your body is literally trying to say, give me as much as food as possible because you went so long without it and it is a survival mechanism. So please see it as that. Instead of thinking, I'm hungry, I must need more food or even so acting on it impulsively, try and remove yourself from the feeling itself and see it for what it is. It's just a hunger hormone. It's not a reality. Get back to drinking more water, eating more fruits and vegetables, 
a little bit more volume like you were in prep not as much as you were before but uh, definitely as i said removing the emotion around those hormones can make a huge difference and know that it will pass it will pass it's not forever so chatting with others with sorry chatting with others who've been through the, something similar is um incredibly helpful as well so other comp prep competitors because then it can normalize what you're going through and what you're experiencing and just make you feel like you're not alone not just that though talk to your coach because you're hiding things from them as i said previously is not going to benefit you so talk to your coach talk to your coach talk to your coach please talk to your coach if you're one of my competitors talk to me message me what we don't know we don't have this information we're not mind readers we probably know yep they're probably going through some through some hardship here and there but we just don't know what you can't what you're not telling us right uh, we also don't judge you we support you you know I, there's not been once through a reversal where i've seen a competitor eat more food than they wanted to or go over their calories and I've made fun of them I've never done that I would never bring them down if they've made a joke and gone oh you know like I went a bit crazy with ah yeah yeah haha but I would never put them in a position where I want to make them feel less or like they have failed or you know what I mean like I'm not here to shame you I'm not here to say oh bad girl or how dare you or why, why would you do that that's silly because that's not the thoughts that come into my mind and it's not our responsibility as coaches to do that it's actually our responsibility to support you and put you back on track again and not have you feeling like you need to be full of shame it's very normal to have all of these feelings emotions and to go through all of this stuff post-show um the stage will always be there as i said you can come back so with post-show blues try not to get fascinated with competing anytime soon at the end of the day like it's important to accept when something is finished done completed on to the next is the way I see it and um, you know almost look at it is I can improve from here I don't have to keep giving myself that dopamine hit and that satisfaction of being on stage again doing photo shoots or you know um, planning family events travel everything like that like actually looking at things outside of bodybuilding that you've got to look forward to can be um, a saving grace in this situation because then you don't necessarily get so fixated on what's been and done and you then also as well give yourself an opportunity and enough time to improve and not just go back with the same stage package and that is generally six months minimum if not one to two years especially if you've got to grow a significant amount of muscle tissue um, you are not exempt from it everybody is the same especially when you're natural so a deload week uh, week or week of training as I said um, negotiate that give yourself time to fall back in love with the sport and keep up as I said the healthy habits you had in prep so I keep returning to these because these are all the reminders of little methods and and tips and pointers that can help you get back to a balanced headspace um, and with food as well something that I found really helpful was kind of looking at it as just lots of different types of flavors of uh, no different sugar right so i would look at brownies and cakes and cookies and just be like it's the same shit just slightly different flavors um savory things same shit but really fatty or same shit but really processed and so when you start to do that and you realize that a lot of these takeaway foods and everything um you can make alternatives at home or they aren't actually that special at all and that you're just getting food fixated because you're hungry it can then reduce the amount of times you're thinking about them it can then remove the emotion around the foods and as i said wait till you get past this six to eight weeks wait till you get past maybe you know two to three months if you still feel like having a slice of cheesecake well then go and give yourself one but i wouldn't say restrict yourself but just think of it this way the thoughts that you're having about food now they're not the thoughts you're always going to have about food you're not always going to think that way even prior to prep you didn't think like this so you know, if you're craving meat pies or sausage rolls or whatever, and I keep saying this stuff because you're probably thinking, oh, that'd be delicious. You don't actually want it. It's just your mind saying, I kind of feel like that because maybe you've not had as much fats or carbs for a while. When you start to remove the emotion around the cravings and what they translate to, and if you nourish your body and give your body, it might be if you feel like a burger, make one at home, or if you feel like a meat pie, you know, make some, I don't know, mince and gravy and, and try and replicate it in a way where you, know, you can track it. Um, you'd be surprised how much better your experience of reversal will be um, and giving yourself the opportunity to recognize that you do have control of your thoughts your actions you always do um, 
but you don't have to be perfect. You just need to be consistent. As we've said, even with other processes, not just comp prep reversal. Anyway, that's about it from me. So please reach out, especially if you're one of my competitors, please reach out, talk to me. You know, can my inbox is always open. I always message you back really quickly. So don't have any shame. I have all the time in the world for you. Uh, and if you aren't a competitor and you want to talk about reversal, if you're struggling, sorry, one of my competitors and you're struggling post reversal or post show, I'm more than happy to chat with you. If you have a coach, like talk to your coach, but if you don't have a coach and you're worried, you're going crazy, you're spiraling or whatever it might be, reach out and talk to me. I'm more than happy to help out where I can. Or Chloe, Chloe's more than happy to help out as well, but she's got my teething baby at the moment. So thanks a lot for tuning in. I really do hope um, this podcast was helpful. If there's anything else in relation to reversal, recovery, etc., that you'd like to discuss, please feel free to have a chat about it. It's what we're passionate about. Thanks a lot. Looking forward to doing another podcast for you soon. Bye-bye.